Hi, I'm Chris Jeffrey, Chief Policy Officer with COTA WA. A short time ago, I was talking to a good friend of mine who had just returned from overseas and was consequently required to go into self-isolation. As for many of us in this situation, this was the first time he and his wife had been forced to be together 24 hours a day without a break. As you can imagine, there was a lot of adjusting going on in this household, not least of which was how much and what programs to binge watch during the day, replays of football, matches or replays of friends. For many of us, the physical restrictions imposed by the coronavirus pandemic was our introduction into staying within a very limiting environment for an extended period, which may have been our own home, a single room or rented accommodation. But for many people, especially but not always older people, being confined is a way of life. Confinement may be brought about by physical immobility, sickness, progression of degenerative diseases, lack of access to transport, or any number of other reasons. This video and the guide which accompanies it have been developed by COTA WA to support people who cannot physically participate fully in the world around them. We hope that you find it interesting, helpful and practical. Before going any further, a few words about COTA WA. The initials COTA WA stand for Council on the Aging Western Australia. We're the peak advocacy body for seniors, having been formed in 1959 as, wait for it, the Old People's Welfare Organisation. Then, as now, we are dedicated to advancing the rights, needs and interests of older people in Western Australia. Being independent of government, state or national, we pride ourselves on offering impartial advice and suggestions regarding issues of importance to you, our target group. Although a great deal of information about how to survive the lockdown resulted from the COVID-19 restrictions, not much was directed specifically at older people. Many of you are living your lives in a very restricting environment and not just for a limited period. Consequently, we at COTA WA have understood the need to develop a comprehensive guide which would be relevant beyond the lifting of the pandemic restrictions for people who are forced to stay at home. We also realise that most of the COVID-19 suggestions assumed that people had access to the internet and were able to engage in different forms of online communication, such as Zoom. Like my friend I mentioned earlier on, of the roughly 365,000 people aged over 65 in Western Australia, a significant proportion are not online and have no wish to be. What else prompted us to develop a stay-at-home guide? COTA WA communicates regularly with our members as well as the wider population, and our surveys and informal feedback strongly suggested that a simple guide on how to get the most out of confinement, be it short term or long term, would be really helpful. Furthermore, we know that approximately a quarter of people in this state live alone, and although not necessarily confined to home, spend a great deal of time alone, especially as they age. I'm sure you all know someone, like my quarantined friend, who would welcome some practical guidance on how to spend the time more interestingly and more productively. The video lasts approximately 40 minutes, so maybe now is a good time to get yourself a cup of tea. The video deals with several key issues relating to staying at home. Each section is presented by an expert in the area so that you're assured of getting the best information and advice possible. The first section, which deals with services available to older people, is presented by Donna Leckie, who has over 30 years' experience in the aged care sector. Dr David Cook, a cybercrime guru, then provides many tips on how to be alert and hopefully not alarmed in relation to online and telephone scams, general online safety and personal safety within your home. 
Our third section, which is presented by Matt Harris and Professor Bob Ziegler, gets to the heart of preserving your own healthy heart and mind. It focuses on some very useful suggestions for mind and body activities you can enjoy without having to buy expensive equipment or travelling to a gym. Hopefully this video will whet your appetite to get more information and support in your quest to make the most of your time at home. To get the latest information about all matters relating to WA seniors, look at the COTA WA website at www.cotawa.org.au or telephone us on 08-9472-0104. To help you even more, we have developed an online staying at home guide, which is located on the COTA WA website. This guide is very comprehensive and gives you many hints and tips about how to make your confinement less confining. It covers more issues than this video and includes issues such as starting your day, eating well, accessing services you may need, developing interests and hobbies, and staying mentally and physically active. Importantly, it also gives you guidance on getting to sleep and what you can try if you are having sleeping problems. To help you even more, we include a daily and weekly planner so you can get serious about living a fulfilling life at home. Finally, the staying at home guide, and at the end of this video, we have included a list of organisations and their contact details which you might find useful if trying to locate the help or support you may need. You can also add your own personal contacts to this list. We believe that for those of you who are confined at home, this video and its accompanying guide will help you in leading a satisfying and interesting life. Hi, my name's Donna and I'm going to talk to you about how you can get some support and services at home. I've been very lucky to have worked in aged care for almost 30 years. Now, more than ever, access to help at home is readily available and to be deemed eligible is a simple assessment, either by telephone or face-to-face -face in the comfort of your home. I'm going to talk to you today about some of your concerns how you can live safely at home, what services are available and how to access them, eligibility and assessment, the types of home care, and managing anxiety about infection. So let's start by talking about what help you need to stay at home. And here are some of the issues that seniors have identified. I don't drive anymore. I can't get to the shops. I don't feel confident using public transport. I'm not keeping up with all my household chores. I don't always remember appointments. The garden is too much work. I don't want to burden my kids, they're so busy. These are just a few of the issues I hear all the time. So let's point you in the right direction to accessing community care and help address some of your concerns. Accessing care and support in your home can be as simple as a telephone call to My Age Care, 1800 200 422. We also have a website that's available for you to have a look at, the myagecare.gov website. My Age Care is the Australian Government's website and starting point. Eligibility is simple. You need to be over the age of 65, or if you are Aboriginal, or Torres Strait Islander over the age of 50. There must also be a need to be eligible. Being able to get shopping is a need. Unable to drive to appointments is a need. Managing your household chores due to frailty or chronic pain is a need. Help with my medications, that is also a need. Once you are registered with My Age Care via telephone, or online, the next step is getting your assessment. My Aged Care will organise this for you. When you have the assessment, 
it may be over the phone or in person, it is a really good idea to have either a family member with you or a trusted friend who knows you well. For example, I was with one of my clients who was in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease for her assessment. I had gotten to know Wendy really well. She's 81. Wendy's daughters both work full time. They had asked me to be with their mum for the assessment. And when asked the question by the assessors to Wendy, how do you manage to get your shopping done? Wendy responded with, I drive to the shops. I can do it myself. But because I had gotten to know Wendy really well, I knew that she had given up her driver's licence and sold her car due to some early memory loss. I gently reminded Wendy and I let the assessors know that Wendy would need assistance with shopping and transport. It is important that the assessors know what you are struggling with to manage at home. I know that most of us tend to show our best side with everything that we do, but in the case of needing services, it is best to tell the truth about how you are coping. The assessor really needs a good picture of what services will help you remain at home safely and if potentially you need more than a few hours a week help. The two main programs that are offered for community support in your home are the Commonwealth Home Support Program, also known as CHSP, and Home Care Packages, also known as HCP. The Commonwealth Home Support Program is an entry-level home care service that you may need. Basic supports that can make a big difference to your life. Usually this program provides a maximum of around three hours per week of services in your home. You may know this program as HACC, formerly known as Home and Community Care, and includes services such as domestic assistance, nursing, shopping, transport, personal care to help you with your hygiene, meals and food services, home maintenance, social support, which can even be by phone, home modifications, allied health, aids and equipment, and respite care. With the home care packages, that's generally more for complex needs. And the assessor explains to you that there are four levels of care support, ranging from level one to level four. Level four being very high complex care needs. If you are an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander person, aged 50 years or older, there are government funded aged care services available for you. Providers across Australia may offer culturally appropriate or specialised services for Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people. These services include residential and home care. You can find some contact details for rural and remote services at the end of this video and in the stay at home guide. Are you experiencing elder abuse? Elder abuse can happen anywhere, in residential aged care, in community housing, community services, and in families, anywhere. As with many forms of abuse, it is hard to speak out. Sometimes it's even hard to admit it to yourself. When elder abuse happens within families, you can feel ashamed to seek help and fearful of reprisals. Advocates are available to support you. There are many types of elder abuse. Financial, improper use of your money or assets. This can cover withholding money or making decisions on how your money is used without your consent. Neglect, withholding essential care. This can include not providing you with food, shelter, clothing, medical and dental care, or emotional support. Psychological, Inflicting mental anguish, this kind of abuse creates fear or feelings of shame and powerlessness. There are a number of services providing support and advice, including advocacy, legal, government, not-for-profit, and your GP. Dealing with anxiety and depression. Are you feeling anxious? At times, especially if you're living alone and confined to a house, apartment or unit, feelings of anxiety or depression can be really overwhelming. You may have special needs. For example, you may have a disability or mental health issues, 
or you may be LGBTI, or speak English as a second language. Who can you call on to support you? Make a list of family members and friends with contact details that you can call on to help you if you need that. You may be able to ask different people to do different things, like asking someone to help with shopping and someone else to take you to medical appointments. If you don't have family member or friend to talk to, help is at hand with your GP and also with some telephone services who can guide you as to how you may deal with these feelings. Do you have special needs? As Chris said earlier, we've provided a list of contact numbers and websites at the end of the video and in our stay at home guide. Let's talk about your personal safety. Physical supports. Do you have all the help you need to assist you to move around your home as best you can? Things like grab rails, non-slip floor coverings, ramps to access for your steps, appliances. Do you have the special appliances you need to help you live your life more easily? Such as a kettle tipper, an automatic switch off iron, water tap and handle turners. Your care organisation should be able to help you to acquire what you need. Talk with your home care service, they may be able to assist. Another way of staying safe at home is by getting a duress alarm. Whether you wish to engage services from an aged care organisation or not, I really recommend that you at least inquire about a personal alarm. I have this one. And the important part about having a duress alarm is actually wearing it. The one that I'm wearing is very light and comfortable to wear. You don't need to wear the watch and the pendant together. I have them both on here today just for demonstration. They are waterproof and they're safe to wear in the shower. Having a shower is a high falls risk and slips risk, no matter what age we are. It operates on the mobile network, meaning no fixed line or NBN connection is required. To, to call for help, simply press your pendant or the base unit's red help button at any time. 24 hour monitoring centre will contact your support network including carers, family members and emergency services. And don't worry, even if they can't hear you, they will follow your pre-agreed emergency response plan to ensure you've received the help that you need. Staff who visit to support you at home all have, as a minimum, infection control training as well as other education to keep both themselves and you safe. Feel free to check with who is delivering your services to ask them what training their staff have. As organisations that provide services want to assure you what they put in place to safeguard you and their team. Whether it is a domestic assistance service or personal hygiene, all staff have the correct tools. Things like gloves, hand sanitizer, and other equipment. The lovely carers that come to visit to support you at home will more than likely ask you, how are you today? Have you been well? just as you can ask them the same questions. People who work in aged care genuinely care for you and your wellbeing. I hope you found this information helpful. Stay well and enjoy your day. Hi, my name's Dr David Cook. There's never been a better time to understand more about the internet and using your computer, your phone, your tablet, your iPad, or any connected device to access all sorts of services. From online banking to ordering groceries online for delivery to your home and for paying bills without the need to queue in a line. And it's important to be connected with the world and our family and our friends. That means we need to do this in a safe and secure manner. We can run our lives from home and enjoy an enormous array of options from online books, audiobooks, watching trips to favourite destinations, and at the same time, we can access information like never before. The internet can connect us and it can teach us and it can entertain us. So with that in mind, it's really important to use the internet, but to do so in a way that makes us feel safe. Banking and shopping are areas where we need to show caution because we're dealing with money and crooks love money. When it comes to banking, we want to be able to know how much money is in the account. In simple terms, that means knowing what's in the bank. 
Many of us have already used online banking, whilst others are not so sure, preferring to visit the bank face to face. However, whether we go online or our phones or on our tablets, or whether we physically visit the bank, all of our transactions become online transactions. So what do we need to talk about? Well, it's really important that those of us with an online account understand how to change our passwords. Because if you've had a friend help set something up, or maybe someone showed you how it works, then it's important, after they've gone, to change the password so that you have control over your own accounts. Your money and your bank account is important to you, and it should remain in your control. Your password or your PIN number should stay with you rather than being shared. So many people wonder about how to change a password. It could be a password for your computer or a password for your tablet or your iPad. It could be a password for your emails or it could be a password for your bank account. So where can we start? Many computers have a little icon of a magnifying glass. It functions like a search bar and if you tap on it, you can search, for example, password. And a number of options will come up. Usually the first option, or one of the first options, is do you want to change your password? You can use the search icon to look up other things as well. Sometimes you'll find yourself trying to buy something online, but it's not through a business website, um, and rather it's something informal like through eBay or Gumtree. So you won't be able to use a credit card in the same way that you would on a commercial site. The question people often ask is, is PayPal safe? And the answer is yes. In fact, PayPal is one of the safest ways to make a purchase using a credit card in such a way that the seller gets paid but is completely unable to see the information about your credit card. So PayPal is safe. One of the most effective methods in deceiving someone online is to use a tactic called phishing. That's phishing with a PH and not phishing with an F. But the distinction's not a problem. So you get an email and it says something that will ask you to click on a link. It might be a call to action in the form of a fantastic offer or a bargain opportunity. It's sometimes it's a call to ask you to update something. For example, you might see the words, your account has been compromised, please click here to update your details for security. This then takes you to a fake login portal and it gets you to enter in your actual username and password. And the result is that your account details are now shared with someone else. Of course, not every form of deception happens on a website or through email. It's worth noting that some of the most effective ways to deceive older people is through the telephone. Now there are thousands of different scams, but I'd like to mention two in particular that affect older people. They've been shown to be very, very effective. The first uses kindness, and the second uses fear. A common exploit is a person willing to tell you that your phone account is not paid in full and that this is a courtesy call to remind you to pay the additional amount to avoid being cut off. It's a tactic often referred to as pre-texting. These phone scams can be very effective, especially when the person on the call makes it clear they're not after any money. In fact, in the case of several versions, the caller will point you in the direction of a number of options to assist you to get up to date. That might be to advise you to pay online or to pay at the Tel Telstra shop or to pay at the post office. And having established the goodwill of assisting you to avoid being cut off, the caller might then engage in something called social engineering. In short, they'll have a chat and during that chat, they'll be very nice to you. If they can keep talking with you for five to 10 minutes, they will establish a social bond with you that makes it easy to change the call. And under these circumstances, a caller will often finish their call in a flustered state, claiming that their boss will be furious because they've been chatting to you for so long. They'll actually make you feel guilty. And this is, a, and this is when you can be very, very vulnerable, especially when the call changes and they ask for a credit card number to pay off the fictitious five or $10 that's owed. About one in five people will fall for this form of social engineering. It's very effective. The second kind of social engineering is at the other end of the human experience. It can be in the form of a threatening phone call over an outstanding amount, such as an unpaid bill or an overdue tax payment. These calls will often use threatening language to make an individual feel vulnerable and alone. Don't fall for this trick. For some of us, we use an answering machine to screen out unwanted calls. 
However, in the last couple of years, we've seen an increasing number of people who have been deliberately hoping to call someone with an answering machine. They use stern, determined demands that sound authentic and frightening. And if done properly on an answering machine, an individual can find themselves playing the message back over and over, all the time becoming more convinced to pay the caller so that they don't receive a knock on the door or a person meeting them at their house. Lastly, it's important to remember that one of our most valuable assets is to have a strong password. Many people often say they can't remember all of their passwords. If that's you, then here's some good advice. Use a pass phrase. The phrase can be used for multiple passwords. It should be something that you know as a common phrase, but that might not resonate with other people. Pass phrases are excellent ways for older people to find a way to avoid trying to remember different passwords in different accounts. Stay safe and enjoy the internet. Technology can help bridge the gap between family, friends, and day-to-day -day engaging in life. Many people start to feel less safe and secure as they age, even in their own home, and media reports of home invasions contribute to this feeling, even though the incidence of such crimes is relatively low. There are several things that you can do to make yourself feel physically safe at home, just as there are ways to increase your cybersecurity so that you're less susceptible to scams and fraud. It's a good idea to spend some time making your home look active and clear. Keep foliage trimmed for a clear line of sight out of windows. Crooks, thieves and con men will always prefer to visit the front door of a house that can't be seen from the street. If people visit you in the evening, make sure the house lights are turned on to give the impression of activity and movement. Having a bright light at the front of your house gives a clear indication that you're up and about. Thieves always prefer to work in the shadows. Know your neighbours and make sure that they know you. One of the best forms of security is the eyes and ears of our neighbours. Always be careful who is present when you're sharing private information about yourself. Be discreet about discussing your financial or living arrangements loudly in public or at the front door. Do not give your telephone number or reveal any information about yourself to unknown people. Keep your windows and doors locked at all times. Never allow a stranger into your home. Be aware of people who state that they are permitted to enter because they have some form of special authority. If this is the case, ask them to show proof of identity and any such authority so that they're satisfied that they are who they say they are. Don't hesitate to say no to someone at the door and to ask them to leave. Be aware of anyone trying to sell a service or collect donations for a charity. Ask to see proof of their charity status or proof of their business before you start any talk with them. If you don't use online banking, having a small amount of cash is acceptable, but having hundreds and hundreds of dollars makes you look like a target. One of the best ways to retain access is by having a small debit card like a credit card, but you top it up according to your needs. These are better to use than a fully active credit card that may have reserve limits of many thousands of dollars. Another option is to keep your money safe by having an Australia Post gift card. You can get these from the Australia Post post office and you decide how much to keep in them. It might be $100 or it might be up to $500, but it will allow you to have some control of money without the need to keep going to the bank and that means you can access many more services that require payment using a card rather than cash. Hello everyone, I'm Bob Ziegler. I've been an ambassador for the Council on the Aging for the last 15 or 16 years. Those of you who have been in the Living Longer, Living Stronger would probably recognize me. As we get older, it's important that we keep connected for our mental and our physical health. One way of doing this is to have an active interest and that'll keep us connected and we'll try to give you some hit stories and tips today on how to do that. Hi, my name's Matt Harris and I'm an exercise physiologist and the owner of Exercise for Life. My mission in life is to keep seniors physically active, engaged and organized. Some of the things we're going to talk about today is setting yourself small goals, keeping active 
and keeping engaged with your friends. Bob, how do you normally stay connected? We use Facebook, Skype, Instagram, and all sorts of social media. What do you find best works for you and your family? We get together with our family uh, in a variety of ways because they're spread all over the world. So they're in different time zones and it's difficult to get everybody at one time. Some we use Skype, but most of them, it's getting them by telephone at a specific time that we agree on that we're able to get together with them. Bob, how do you feel in your day? As an exercise physiologist, it's my job to ensure that people are maintaining their physicality and their muscle mass. But I'm really interested in what you do to do the same thing. Oh, since we can't go to the gym now, uh, we do some exercises at home, uh, mainly aimed at our mobility and our ability to do things in life. So uh, we do squats. So that enables us to get in, up and down out of chairs. We also go out front and walk go up and down our little steps. So if we have to go up the stairways, we can still do all of that. Um, then for some of them, we go into the kitchen where we do have a counter that we can hold on to so it doesn't uh, give us any problem, such as heel-toe, heel-toe walking. And uh, being there, when we get through with our exercises, <laughs> we think, oh, what are we going to plan for food for this day? And so uh, we can then plan what kind of meals we'd like to have and do our shopping and we're ready to go. Sounds pretty regimented. I think we might have to get everyone around your house to uh, get involved in your exercise. So as you're progressing your exercise, do you buy a bigger turkey to lift more weight or is it just keep the same turkey size? Uh, I didn't know we had turkeys here in Australia, but that's all right. <laughs> Not keeping this exercise thing too serious, Bob, but it's really important about keeping moving and doing activities that challenge the body and challenge the brain. My dad's 92, mum's 88. Dad goes swimming down the beach every day and they both go square dancing two days a week. What are some of the things you do, mate? Oh, a whole variety of things. Um, I still like to read an awful lot, which I've always done. And uh, I enjoy my golfing. I belong to a golf club and play golf once a week. Um, and uh, some other things would be uh, I do volunteering and uh, various activities of that particular kind. And my wife has belonged to two quilting groups for the last 25 years. So those kinds of things uh, kind of keep us connected with what we're doing and with other people. In this time with our social isolation, it's a little bit difficult for people to be carrying out activities like my mum and dad, if they're not dancing anymore. Dad does still go down the beach. What do you think are some things people could do if they're not able to do their normal activities? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> there are a lot of little uh, exercises we can do at home. We can always go for a walk, which is always good for your health. Perhaps do more in the garden than we did before. Uh, Volunteering, I think, is a wonderful thing to do because that keeps you involved with something. And uh, I think uh, those are the kind of things that I would suggest. Bob, did you know that after the age of 30 that you lose 2% of muscle mass per year, which can have quite a large impact on your physical capacity and your mobility? So it shows that conducting physical activity, particularly resistance weights, plays a really important role in sustaining your muscle mass. But most importantly, that translates into sustaining your ability to move, your ability to do daily tasks, and also to prevent things like falling. So some of the things at this time to do, you mentioned squats. Sitting to standing is very important in sustaining your quadricep, hamstring, and gluteal strength. And these essentially is what keep you upright but also help you move and be translated. And doing exercises, like you said, like calf raises, which help with your calves to sustain strength, which are always really important in sustaining upright posture so that we can prevent falls in the street or at home. People wouldn't believe that you're 91, mate. What's your secret? Uh, besides good genes, 
Uh, yeah. It's uh, having stayed active all my life. Uh, I was in athletics all through high school and university. And uh, after that, when I started teaching, I coached and I refereed. So that kept me active in those kinds of things. Uh, when uh, I came to Australia, after we retired, I worked with wheelchair basketball for a number of years. And uh, then I've actually, I've been with Living Longer, Living Stronger also. So th those are the kind of things that, that I do. It sounds really daunting for people to say to be active and to participate and do all of this exercise. But I was only chatting to my dad on the weekend and it's so important that you do have this history of activity. Um, he was on a milk round for 25 years and ran for 25 years. And uh, you could also say it's in his genes that he's well, but I think we have a responsibility to ourselves to participate in some form of activity that that's relevant to us that can help us be well. Oh, absolutely. If you don't participate in things, as you said, you lose 2% of your fat, of your muscle mass a year. Uh, I'm past 30. <laughs> Just. <laughs> so Matt, as an expert in physiology and exercise, what do you recommend as resistance exercise that we might do at home now that we can't be in gyms? It's a really good question, Bob. I think sometimes people get a bit scared by the term resistance weights. But it's about getting creative at home and starting with small goals. So we could start to add load simply with milk bottles, with socks filled up with sand or rice, and using those as a resistance against your body. So getting creative and just moving these resistances to apply a stimulus to your body. But starting small and then building things up. And the best place to start from there is to think, how does my body respond? How do I feel? If it felt too easy to begin with, then you can add just a little bit more. So Bob, a really good place to start is to set some goals. Now these goals are specific to you, so it doesn't have to be what Arnold Schwarzenegger does. That sounds like a really good idea. And I like that idea of having the goals. And some other goals that we might look at are what are some kind of things that we might want to be doing to keep ourselves busy? And uh, I was thinking of that and thinking about, you know, a good goal would be to decide I should go through my wardrobe and see what are some clothes that I don't need or some other things in the house that, that we don't use anymore but that we don't need. And we can give those to charity. So doing those should keep me active for quite a long time. I would assume so. That sounds like a good idea, mate. I've spent most of my life in academia, so uh, my mind is still fairly active, and I keep doing things. For instance, I do a Sudoku every day. My wife does a crossword every day. Uh, Matt, what, what would you suggest to people that they do to keep their minds active? It could be a good idea to spend some time with your pets, so performing activities with them that possibly you haven't done before throwing the ball to them, getting them to come back, walking different places that you haven't walked with the pet before, driving to a place, going to a new location. That exposes the pet to a new stimulus, that exposes you to a new stimulus, and that is good to, to challenge your mind and to challenge your awareness of a different environment. When you lose motivation, Bob, you tend to let things slide a bit, and in this time of being uh, isolated to home, often people can fall out of the routine. I think the key is to, to sustain that daily routine and with the routine is reward yourself for carrying these tasks out. So thinking about what I would do normally and try to keep that consistent behavior and maybe at the end of it, reward yourself with a little bit of cake or a slice of cheese might be a good idea as a motivation. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. <clears throat> often, uh we let things slide because there seems to be no reason to particularly get it done. But if we stick a reward at the end, that might be good motivation to get at some things that are on the back burner someplace and we haven't done for a while. That's right. Just takes that little bit of motivation, doesn't it? It does.
Without getting too worried about what to do and where to do it, there are lots of resources online for seniors. When you're pursuing this, just make sure that you're doing what's suitable for you, what you feel comfortable with, and what is something that your body is used to. Set your level low to start, and then you can progress it as you feel better. Make sure though, that if you haven't participated in physical activity before, that you speak to your GP, so they can give you some advice on what they believe is suitable and what's not that's suitable for you. Bob, thanks so much for today. It's been fantastic sitting down with you and spending time to talk about these really important issues. I've enjoyed it. And this is a good time for you to think about things that you may not have done for a while, and it gives you the opportunity to do them. Remember, the only limitation you have is your motivation and your initiative. As you reach the end of your day, getting a good night's sleep is just as important to your general mental and physical well-being as spending the day with a mix of mental and physical activities. We tend to think of sleep as a time when the mind and body shut down, but this is not the case. Sleep is an active period in which a lot of important processing, restoration and strengthening occurs. One of the vital roles of sleep is to help us solidify and consolidate memories. As we go about our day, our brains take in an incredible amount of information. Our bodies all require long periods of sleep in order to restore and rejuvenate, to grow muscle, repair tissue and synthesize hormones. Before going to bed, review your day. Think about it especially the things you enjoyed, as you want to go to bed feeling as calm and relaxed as possible. Perhaps make a diary entry, or call a friend to share your pleasure, and occasionally the things you didn't like about the day. It's well researched that it's best to avoid going straight to bed after watching TV. If you need to take medication at night, now is the time, perhaps with a warm, non-caffeinated drink. The occasional bout of sleeplessness, such as difficulty getting to sleep or waking during the night for a lengthy period, is common. Some common suggestions to deal with this include avoiding a nap during the day, avoid watching TV just before bed, engaging in deep breathing and relaxation exercises, making a cup of herbal tea or a warm milk drink. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found the video helpful.